You know, my life is changing, y'all. By next year, I'll be graduated from college. Sac State Stingers up! And by next year, I'll be getting married! So God has tremendously blessed me. I just feel so honored, so privileged, and I'm just thankful to give the message here this morning. And you know, this Sunday feels different than the rest of them. This Sunday feels a little bit more special than the rest of the Sundays that I brought the message before because I really feel like God has me on assignment. I feel like he has me on a secret mission. And that secret mission is to tell all of us in here that we're marked by God. No, 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 I don't think y'all get it. We're marked by God. And I know that may sound a little cliche to hear, like, "Eh, okay, Ty, I get it. We're marked by God. But no, seriously, you're marked with a purpose. You're marked for, 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 uh, for, for a bigger and greater reason than you could ever imagine. God's marked you for destiny. He's marked you for impact. And he's anointed you beyond anything you could ever see, vision, or think of. And it's important for us to get that. It's important for us to hear that because the enemy wants to come at you. The enemy wants to twist your mind, and what he can't destroy, he distracts, and he wants to distract us, and he wants us to quit. He wants us to give up. You're too old. Maybe if you were in your 20s or your 30s, this would be believable, or you remember what you used to be like, there's no way that God can use you. Or look at how you are now. Impossible. But I'm here to tell you today, beloved, that regardless of the situation, Regardless of what we're going through, regardless of who we used to be, you're still marked by God to fulfill the purpose. Everybody say, I'm marked. marked. (sighs) And when I began to think about people that were marked, anointed, called, I thought of David. And he was marked at a very, very young age. But there was a process to his purpose. Right? He didn't just wake up one day and go from, oh, I'm in the pasture, I'm with the sheep, to I'm the king of Israel. It took time. So today, I want to go through David's life with you, and I want to go through the different seasons, the different steps that we'll go through when we're marked by God. Y'all ready to receive the word? Yes. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for just being here. God, your grace exceeds any bounds or any rooms or any person that will ever be on this earth, God. I just pray right now that through your grace, you just help us all receive a custom message, a message inscribed from your word, not from my lips. Remove me out of the equation, God, and have me just be a vessel for you to use. In Jesus' mighty name, we all say, Amen. amen. So today's message is coming from 1 Samuel chapter 16, but before we get there, i got to give you guys a little bit of a backstory just so we can catch up to where we're at. So there once was a king whose name was Saul, and Saul is the guy that everybody thinks was crazy, wild, and just out of his mind. But it didn't used to always be like that. Saul was anointed. He was one of God's marked. He had the anointing of God, and he was chose to be king. But Saul started to do things his way. He started to do things outside of what God wanted him to do, so he had to move Saul out of the way and mark somebody else, anoint somebody else to do what God originally had for Saul. So the prophet Samuel that originally marked Saul was hurt, destroyed. He was broken, y'all. And so God comes to Samuel in his hurt and in his pain and says, look, don't worry. We'll be all right. I have somebody else that's anointed, so fill your flask with olive oil. Get ready, get set, let's go. And here's where we pick up. This is coming out of 1 Samuel chapter 16, and we're just going to read from verse 6 to verse 13. And if you don't have it, it's on the screen for you to read. This is coming out of the NLT version. It says, when they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. Isn't it good that God doesn't look at us by what we look like on the outside? But check this out, check this out. The Lord doesn't see things the way that you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Amen. 
Then Jesse told his son, Abinadad, to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shemia. But Samuel said, neither is this the one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse replied. Watch this, y'all. But he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Isn't it interesting that David's dad marked him with a characteristic that is unattractive? His own father. I just find that so interesting. But isn't it beautiful that God doesn't care about any of that? Isn't it beautiful that God doesn't look at the outside and he looks at the heart and he says, regardless of what other people say, you're marked. Somebody with faith say, I'm marked. And it goes on to say, send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down and, and eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark, handsome, with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one. Anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil that he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David on that day. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. Can I tell you all a story? Can I tell you our story? Yes. yes. Awesome. So if you don't know, I have a little brother, and his name is Neil, and I'm the oldest out of us two. Neil's four years younger than me. And we grew up in Long Beach, California. And one day, we're sitting in our baby blue painted room on our bunk beds, and we're, I'm 10 at the time, Neil's six. And so we're crazy little kids. So we do a crazy little kids, what young boys do, and we wrestle a lot. And my mom hated it. My mom hated it. It got on her nerves. But this one particular day, my mom's supersonic mom hearing knob was turned down just a couple notches, like one and a half, y'all. So we were able to get away with a little bit more than we usually do. So we're sitting on the top bunk, and I come up with a brilliant idea of nil. Let's have a slap fight. But no headshots. No headshots at all. And so six-year-old Neil goes, mm, okay. So we're hitting each other, pop, pop. Keep in mind, I'm four years older, so I'm 10 and he's six. So I'm hitting him, and I'm just dodging everything. Ha, sucker, you can't hit me. And so I'm not really paying attention because after a while, it starts to get boring. And I vaguely, no, I distinctly remember Neil's little six-year-old arm wind up. He makes eye contact with me, and he just looks at me. <laughs> and he goes, you disgust me. And pow, <laughs> hits me straight in the face. And so I'm hot, y'all. I'm like, hey, hey, my head's this way. And I'm like, yo, Neil, you said no headshots, man. You said we weren't going to do that. We agreed. But I try to figure out why is this memory, aside from the fact that it's hilarious, why does this memory keep coming back to my head? And God put it on my heart that, Ty, there's no hit like the one that you don't see coming. And some of us in this place have been hit across the face by life, and we're laying on the ground, and we're laying there, and people are counting one. They're not getting up. Two, they're not getting up. But God's saying, get up! Because you're marked by God, you have purpose, and you have a plan that you need to fulfill. So I want to help us today. I want to help by making this transition easier. See, when we're marked by God, there's seven steps, seven seasons, or seven hits, if you will, that we will have to go through to reach our purpose. So today, let's go through those seven hits by looking at David's life and seeing what they are. Are y'all ready? If you are marked by God, you will be approved in private. This is the one that messes with people. Because we want people to see our elevation. We want people to see what's going on in our lives. We want people to acknowledge that God did speak to me when I was sitting at that conference. Or I was, you know what? I was at the meeting, and I was sitting in the back row, and God did touch me. Or God did call me to a great purpose. But... He's intentionally approving you in private. Why? Because it's easiest to kill something at its infant stage. Raise your hand if you hate spiders. Think about how easy it is to kill a baby spider, right? It's easiest to kill something when it's at its infant stage. And a lot of us have dreams, and we have visions, and we have words that God has spoke to us, but they're still at baby state. They're still at baby state. They're still at seed form. They haven't fully developed yet. 
And so we go and we tell everybody. We tell, God told me I'm going to be a youth pastor. You know what? God told me I'm going to be the worship director. God told me that I'm going to be the head usher. God told me that I'm going to lead a million-man march around Sacramento. And what that does, though, that's not bad. Everybody doesn't need to know that. Because when we do this, it opens the door for people to come in and stab and to kill and to steal. Excuse me, and steal and destroy and take life and speak death into a situation that should be, have life spoken into it. Think about it, y'all. What did they do when they were afraid of Jesus, the Messiah, the infant, the baby? They sent out an every male under the age of two they killed. Why? Because it's easiest to kill a king in kid form. I want to encourage you all. That just because everybody doesn't see the mark that God's placed on you doesn't mean it's not there. And everybody doesn't need to see it. Beloved, we have to get to a place where we're not looking for people on the earth to confirm what God's already said yes to in heaven. Somebody say, I'm marked. If you're marked by God, you're going to be anointed before you're positioned. So let's picture this scenario in terms of David's life. So David who is called from the fields. He's brought back into his father's house. His brothers are standing around him hungry and jealous, and they're watching Samuel just pour this olive oil. And I can just imagine it dripping down his head, and he's anointed. And it says in the Bible, the spirit of the Lord overwhelmed David, and it never left him. So this is probably a very emotional and heavy, heavy, thick situation for David. But notice something. After that whole thing happens, where does David go? Back to the pasture. Back with the sheep. He doesn't go to the palace. I don't know about all of you, but me, if I was in that situation, I would be like, yo, Samuel, you got room for plus one? Is there, there, there room in that caravan, in that carriage? Right? That would be the natural thought. We would think that, all right, God, you've anointed us, so we're supposed to get positioned, right? Wrong. That's not how things work. See, the anointing doesn't mean that we require a special position, right? I find it very interesting that when David was anointed, God put him right back with the sheep. During this Life season, God is calling us to be a difference in dark places. God is calling us to be the light where there's dark, to be the light on the top of the mountain in an arena or a situation that does not look like where you may be serving or where God's called you to. I really, really believe that in this season, God is checking to see, how are you going to wait? And I don't, I don't know about you all, but in this season specifically, it's really hard for me. And sometimes I end up waiting like this. <sighs> Hello, God, do you, you see me down here? I'm waiting. Do it again. You know, come on. God, hello. All right. You want me to go serve there? All right. And we're dragging our feet, right? When really, when really... We should be waiting like this. I'm at your service, God. I'm willing to go anywhere you want me to. I'm willing, you want me to serve here? Sure. You want, me to, you want me to do, yes. You see, it's not, we're not waiting on God. We're waiters here at God's service, here at other people's service. During the season, you need to go find somebody you need to serve because God isn't looking for a plan from you. He's looking for a heart posture and a heart posture of service. I have a, a, some scripture that I want to I say, and I want to encourage you with it, because this hit, if you don't see it coming, can really be a devastating one, because we'll stand, and we'll sit, and we'll wait, and we'll wait, and we'll wait, and we'll lose hope. We'll be like, God, I'm anointed, right? And God will go, yeah. God, you care about me, right? And God will go, yeah. And I'll be like, so what's my position? Go back with the sheep. Go be with the sheep, man. And through this waiting process, hold on to this word. This comes from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. And it says, trust in the Lord with what? All your heart and lean not into your own understanding. See, God is not looking for a plan from us, y'all. 
He's just looking for us to have the right heart and be obedient. Somebody with faith say, I'm marked. When you are marked by God, you become the answer to a problem. Think about it. So back to David's life, rewind. So David is doing double duty, right? He's still serving at the, or excuse me, excuse me, he's not doing double duty. David is still with the sheep. He's hanging out with the sheep. And remember, Saul, like I said earlier, was marked by God at one point, but the anointing was lifted. And so it says in the Bible, he was tormented by evil spirits and he could not sleep. So David's advisor, or not David's advisor, Saul's advisors and Saul's assistants recommended, hey, why don't you get somebody in here that can play an instrument, that can play a harp? And Saul goes, well, do you know anybody? And they go, yeah, I know that David guy. He'd be out there playing his guitar. He's super, super, super good. You should bring him in. Notice I did not say that David sent out an application. Notice I did not say that David went up to the palace and Hear me, y'all. David knew he was going to be king. He was told he was going to be king. So the great amount of humility for him to sit, be still, and just be okay with being in the presence of God is astonishing to me. Because if it was me, I would have been at that palace door every day. You forget about me? Hello? I'm anointed, right? You, You called me to this, right? So I should be in there with you. But David waited it out. He waited it out, and he was comfortable and okay with trusting that God was going to take him there. Y'all, when we do what God wants us to do, they will send for you. They sent for David. David didn't do anything other than follow the word, follow God, and stay with the sheep. And they sent for him. Y'all, if you want to get taken to the next level, if you want to fly through this test, if you want God to really see that you have a proper heart, find somebody in your life that you call a leader and serve them and ask them, what is the biggest problem that you have? What is tormenting you right now? And how can I get rid of it? Young people, high schoolers, college students that still live with your parents, those dishes, they be stacking. (laughs) Make it your life mission that any time a dirty dish goes in that sink, you're going to clean it because you're tormenting everything that torments your parents. And see what God does in your life. And for those of you that have a job with a supervisor that you can't stand, I want you to go to work. I know I'm younger than you, but just listen. I want you to go to work on Monday, look your supervisor in the eye, and with the correct heart posture say, what is your biggest problem right now on the job? And how can I torment it? And don't ask for a pay raise. Don't ask for a thank you. Don't even ask for a thank you email. Just do it because God is looking for the right heart. Go serve somebody. You'll see why this heart work is so important. See, if we're marked by God, your opportunity will be wrapped in obedience. Let me say that again. Your opportunity will be wrapped in obedience. So back to David. David is doing double duty. He's serving in the palace. He's playing the harp for Saul. Saul. It's so hard for me to say Saul because I have a really good friend whose name is Sal. So I go back and forth, so be patient with me. He's hanging out, and he's playing the harp for Saul. And he's also still back at the pasture helping his father with the sheep. What great humility. What great nobility. See, David was lowly in spirit. Think about it. If this was me, I don't know about you all. I'm not trying to call nobody out. But if this was me and I was playing for the king and my dad or my mom came to me and said, hey, Tyler, can you help out with these dishes? Can you take the trash out? I'd be like, bro, I'm at the palace. So I don't really have time to to do that kind of stuff. But thank you. But see, David was lowly in spirit, and he had humility, and he was obedient to God and to his father. So when his dad said, hey, David, can you drop off this food or these grilled cheeses to your brothers at war? He didn't even think about it. He said, yeah, I'll do it. So he takes these sandwiches, and you guys got to realize something. Here's where the obedience comes in. Here's where his opportunity comes in. If he never took those sandwiches to his brothers at war, he would have never met Goliath. He would have never met Goliath. And this really hit home for me because I ask myself, and I want to ask you the same question, how many opportunities have we missed out on because of our lack of obedience towards God? 
How many opportunities? Ah, I don't really like kids, but God keeps nudging me to go hang out with the children or... Man, why do you keep asking me to go to the senior citizen's home? I don't even, seniors don't even like me, and God is sitting in heaven saying, you're missing it. It's not about the situation. It's not about the people. It's not even about you. It's about you obeying me and listening. It's about obedience. You don't need to understand to be obedient. Sheesh. See, if David didn't have the right heart, he would have never met Goliath. And the opportunity to take down Goliath would have never been there. It would have never been there. And he would have missed out on a momentous occasion that all of, all of us in this room, or the majority of us, have heard. David was still humble enough to go in the palace and still serve in the pasture. And because of his willingness to be humble and obey his father, he was able to meet Goliath. He would have never met his opportunity for elevation. He would have been sitting in the palace thinking, I'm being used by God. This is what God wants me to do. A lot of times we get caught up in the he said or she said of the moment when, end up, when we end up missing that it's not about them, the arena, or the circumstance. It's just about us trusting God and being obedient. Somebody say I'm marked. When we're marked by God, our, opportun- our obstacles become opportunity. Our obstacles become opportunity. It, see, it's prominent in Western culture for when we get pushed against or when we reach a challenge, we just step back, right? Ah, oh, to get into that college. Maybe God don't really want me to go to college. Or, ah, oh, to get that job. Maybe God just is calling me to not work right now. Or, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Or, oh, I didn't, you know, I don't really see that my calling is coming to light. So, you know what? Maybe this is not what God has for me. Well, that's not what God says. See, so back to where David's at right now currently in life. So he gets to his brothers, and he drops off these sandwiches. And as he drops off the food to his brothers, he looks up and he sees this super tall Philistine dude with a bushy beard and with a whole bunch of swords and he's just big. And he's talking to his brothers and he's like, yo, who is that? And he said, what? And he's saying, what? Why aren't you guys doing anything? And he's been doing this for 40 days and he's been talking about your God and you're refusing to say or do anything? What's wrong with y'all? So we're thousands. Hear this, y'all. We're thousands took a big step back. David said, this this is not an obstacle. This is an opportunity for me to show that God's been working on me. Do y'all hear this? And this point proves through David's life that when we're anointed, we don't need a special position because God was working on David behind closed doors. If you remember, for those of you that are familiar with the story, David's killed lions David's killed bears protecting the sheep with just stones and a sling. So he looked, at David, he looked at Goliath and he said, you know what? I'm not afraid of this uncircumcised Philistine. That was bad words back then, y'all. So there was probably just a big beep, <laughs> right? And so he's just like, I'm not beep. So he looks down and he picks up these smooth stones and he's like, I've killed bears. I've killed lions, so I'm just going to take this sling, and I'm going to swing it up, and bam, down goes Goliath. Because God's been working on me behind closed doors. I haven't given up on my gifts, and I've still been playing harp. I'm still using what God has already given me, so I'm good to go. Obstacles and opportunities are not that different. The only difference is an obstacle becomes an opportunity when you have God on your side. I'll say that again for y'all that are here. An obstacle becomes an opportunity when you have God on your side. See, David understood this and he got this. So where everybody was backing up, where the Israelite army was frozen and shaken and and scared, I'm like, oh, what are we going to do? David said, watch me work. Watch me work. And not because of anything I'm doing but so that God can receive the glory. See, see, David was in that position because he was obedient. 
David was in that position because he was humble. David was in that position because God was with him. Why was God with him? Because he spent so much time in his presence. So if you feel, if the question is coming in your head, God, what do I do? Do the last thing I told you, which was sit in my presence. That's it. And allow God to work and see what he does. When you are marked, you will be approached with obstacles. But you will see them as an opportunity to step forward. Everybody say step forward. Step forward. And bring God glory. This is a part of us being molded into what God wants us to be. See, when you're marked, you overcome obstacles. See, when God is with you, nothing can stand in your way. See, when God is for us, then who can be against us? Sheesh. And some of y'all are going through obstacles right now, and we're looking at them in our face. How are we going to reach our community? How am I going to relate with these young people? God, how is our church going to grow? They're, op- they're opportunities for God to show up and show out. So we need not to worry, y'all. God's got it under control. All we need to do is what? Step up. And God will take care of the rest. Somebody with faith say, I'm marked. (sighs) Okay, God. So you're telling me that I just need to understand that I'm going to be approved in private. All right, check. I don't need anybody else to say that I'm marked. All right, God, so you're telling me that, that my anointing comes from my positioning. So all I need to understand is that is that I don't need to, to receive a position. I just need to know that I need to sit in your spirit and be all right with that. Check. Okay, God, you're telling me that I need to be a solution to a problem. So I need to, I need to find a leader and serve them and not look for a reward. Okay, check. All right, God, you're telling me that my opportunity to be wrapped in obedience. So if I continue to be obedient, you'll take care of everything. If I continue to listen, to you, you'll be good. And you're telling me that obstacles become opportunity. So they're not really obstacles. They're more of just an opportunity for you to receive glory and for you to elevate me to the next position. And then you tell me that if I'm marked by God, all I need to do is be me? Isn't that mind-blowing? Isn't that, isn't that incredible? See, David, what really stuck out to me about this whole thing is David could not fit Saul's armor. They tried to put it on him, and it was huge. And they realized, he realized this is not for me. This isn't me. God needs me to be David. God needs me to be who? He's called me to be. And see, this is important for us to understand because if we're not sure of who God has created us to be, then it's impossible or really difficult for us to fulfill the task that he has for us. You have to be the you that God has created you to be. Now, I'm not giving you an excuse to sin. I'm not giving you an excuse to cut up. But what I am saying is that when God created us and before we were formed in our mother's womb, he had a plan for us to fulfill. That's the you I'm talking about, the original design that through the gospel of Jesus Christ, he wants to bring back to light. God does not expect us to be something that we aren't. He is going to use you as you are. So don't think, oh, oh, but I need to, I need to just, I need to hang around Pastor Troy more because he's awesome and because people say we're similar, so I need to be more like him. No, God wants to use me the way that I am, and he wants to use you the way that you are. You have to be willing to trust that the person that God originally designed is good enough and allow his grace to fill out the rest. It's got to be. That's it. Somebody with great faith say, I'm marked. When you are marked by God, watch this, you must have the audacity to honor. So, for those of you that are familiar with the story, David, and those of you that are not, I will catch you up. David just cut off Goliath's head, knocked this giant down. And so he hand delivers it to Saul, pow, on the table. And it was probably a big old head, probably about this big, right? Because the dude was huge. So he delivers it on the table, pow, and it shakes everything, and the coins and his iPhone falls on the floor, and his Gatorade's knocked over, right? It's, it's crazy. Like, it's a momentous occasion. And so Saul is amazed by David because everything, see, this is where obedience is key, everything that God asked, or not God, excuse me, that Saul asked David to do, he did it. He fulfilled it. It says in the Bible, any task that was given to David, he fulfilled it, and Saul 
built up great trust in David. So he made him the captain over one of his armies. And David was slaying people left and right. I mean, like, David was knocking people down to the point where he had groupies. Like, you got to understand, it even says in the Bible that Saul slay 1,000, but David slay 10,000. Right? He had groupies, y'all. So imagine how easy it is for your head to get big when you're doing all these things. And this is God's way. So it's going to be amazing, and people are going to have their minds willing to be like, wow, how are you doing this? So all the clout, all the attention that David was receiving made Saul kind of jealous, right? Remember, he, just, just paint this picture. He was already a little on the, the crazy side because imagine trying to go to sleep every night and being tormented by a dream. Imagine not being able to rest, so he's probably cranky. He's at war, so he's probably hungry, right? So all this crazy stuff is going on, and then to come to find, you think that this young guy is trying to steal your glory. He's trying to steal your throne. So Saul goes on this lifelong mission for 10 years trying to kill David. He's trying to take him out, y'all. What am I saying in all this? There are going to be some people in your life, and you have to see this hit coming. There are going to be some people in your life that you thought were for you that when you step into the calling that God has given you, they may end up being against you. That bestie that you had for life, oh, my gosh, they're my bestie. I love them. When you start spending more time with God and your hangout time is limited because you understand that you need to be with the sheep and that you need to be in your word, you need to be sitting in God's presence, and so they start to question your friendship and they walk away, I'm telling y'all, we need to get this one because this hurts the most, for me at least, because I'm very relational. This one hurts me the most because, because we begin to question, we begin to say, wait, God, have you really called me to this? Is this really what you want me to do? Yes, no, 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 yes. You are called. You are called. You are marked by God. But we have to see this hit coming. And so David, there's this story in the Bible where David is in the same cave as Saul. And it says that Saul was relieving himself. And a couple of David's buddies look and they're like, yo, David, is that Saul? And David goes, yeah, that is Saul over there. And his friends go, hey, hey, kill him. He's been trying to kill you for 10 years, man. You can end all this right now. And David thought about it. And it sounded like a good idea. It sounded right. Just a pin to that point. Sometimes it feels good to get revenge in the moment. But we need to let God take care of it. We need to let God take care of it. So David sneaks up behind Saul. I don't know how somebody sneaks up behind you and cuts off a piece of your robe. But this robe that Saul was wearing, he had a big ego. I'd imagine it'd probably be from here to the end of the foyer. It was probably super, super long. But David cuts off this little piece of his robe, and he takes it. But what did that show? It showed his humility. It showed that David had an understanding that it's not my time yet. It's not my time, and I need to be audacious, and I need to honor this man. Check this out. It comes in from 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 6. He said to his man, and listen to these words, y'all. He said to his man, the, men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master or to my leader, the Lord's anointed, or lay a hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. So I just want to acknowledge the elephant in the room. It is very possible for people to be in leadership but not have God's anointing. But that does not give you the green light to try to take them out. Because what ends up happening is, see, God's already dealing with them. God's already dealing with their situation, and they're receiving their consequences for their actions. But you don't want to disqualify yourself. You don't want to do anything that would damage your reputation or that would tarnish your name out of pride. I'm better than them. Look at how they do that. <clears throat> Look at how they line people up. I can do that. Or look at how they talk to people. I'm way better than that. Until God removes that person, they're your leader, and you need to honor them and obey. And you're not obeying them. You're obeying God. Until God moves your boss 
or your person of frustration, they are still your leader. God is already dealing with them based on their actions, but you will disqualify yourself if you don't have the audacity to honor. I want to close with this. See, everybody in this place, everybody under the sound of my voice is marked by God. They're marked by, you're marked by God to fulfill a purpose. You're marked by God for impact, and you're anointed beyond your wildest dreams. But the question that I have for you is that mark that God has placed on you, will you allow it to take precedence in your life? Will you allow it to be so important that you're willing to protect it from anything, from even your family, from your pastor, from your closest friends? Are you going to allow God to use you in the way that he wants to use you regardless of what other people may think? Are you willing to chase after the call that God has on your life? And if you will go through this process of allowing God to do this thing within you, he will do things and he will bless you beyond anything you could ever dream of or anybody else. And you won't receive the glory, but he will.